The genesis for this talk came out of the idea of the artist as witness, that the act of witnessing is a fact of the work itself. Really, that the work and the seeing was indistinguishable. I was preparing a talk where no doubt I would tell you things that you already knew, a talk where I was smart and giving you a small piece of my intelligence a piece that you could nod yes to, with no sign of vulnerability on my part. This instinct, this deep impulse of mine, is an impulse of privilege. I began, and then I stopped. I stopped because I remembered a moment a couple years ago when I had given a reading in Vermont. A good friend of mine, a famous poet, was in the audience, and afterwards we went out for a drink. I was eager to get his reaction, to hear how much he loved my new poems, to be celebrated by him. So I asked him, uh, what do you think of the new poems? And he looked at me for a moment without saying a word. And then he said, yeah, I like them, but I have a question. When will you stop being the hero of your own work? And so that statement kept coming up each time I sat down to write this. I could hear him. When will you stop being the hero of your own work? When will you stop being the hero of your work? When will you stop being the hero? When will you stop lying, stop excluding yourself from the horrors of the world of which you are a part? And I started to try and recall what had made me believe I was a hero of my own work? What in my life had become a cleaned up story of heroism and why? I remember when both me and this city of mine were very different creatures. I remember when Crips ran Kirby and the Southside White Pride swelled from 50th to 102nd. I remember when people wrote checks at the grocery store and the money my mother got from government assistance was multicolored, a kind of licorice red, sky blue, and bright yellow paper that signaled to everyone in line that our family was poor. I remember at 12, my brother and I worked under the table at a local ma and pa, cleaning out the butcher shop at night, mopping the aisle floors, and stealing 40s of malt liquor, the same brand, we heard about in the, NW, in, in the NWA cassette that we stole, which we would listen to when we weren't listening to Minor Threat. At that age, I was just learning about race, watching the skinheads in the neighborhood, but also sneaking out at night and going to parties in North Portland where the stolen beer allowed me entry, allowed me to dance in rooms that one night got shot up in a drive-by and on any other given night might have guns in the waistbands of some kids there, the little brothers and sisters of bangers, just teenagers dancing to Ice-T's first album. I remember once a kid dancing next to me had a shirt wrapped around his thigh because a bullet had grazed him earlier. I remember I was maybe 13 years old the first time I saw someone get stabbed. My friends and I were skating at the park at Clinton Kelly School when this older guy from the neighborhood came over. He walked over and punched a friend right off of his board, began kicking him. And then another friend, this really quiet kid who could ollie no comply and do the longest rail slides, walked over to the man, pulled out a three-inch knife, and shoved it in his side. I remember we were all surprised. I remember we kept skating until it got dark. 
I remember being chased through the neighborhood on foot by bikers, by skinheads, by cops, by fathers, by rockers, by sharps. I remember the first time someone from the neighborhood killed themselves. I remember he was a year older than I was, just old enough to drive with a permit, and that he shot himself with his dad's 45. I remember being in fights a lot. I remember friends I loved shaving their heads and beating up Asian kids. I remember my mom would stand in line for cheese and milk and rice. And I remember how that block of cheese meant we would feed ourselves and our friends who would come over to our house because no dad raged there and no mother shot heroin. I remember watching my friend's mom shoot heroin. I remember the first time I got jumped. My brother and I were walking home, maybe we were 14 years old, and four skins jumped us and beat us down, one of them knocking my brother out with a pipe. I remember how the cops were interested until they learned the skins had only taken a two liter of Dr. Pepper. After that, the cops took off. I remember never having to be afraid of cops. I remember my friend Rick putting a Bones Brigade sticker on the door of his room, how cool he thought it looked. And when his father came home around 3 a.m., seeing it, kicking in his door, turning on the light, pulling Rick from his bed and smashing him into the wall, I remember his father saying, good night, faggots, and then kicking me in the head before slamming the door and going into Rick's mom's room to do God knows what. I remember Rick's mom rarely left the house. I remember the murder trial in high school and being on the stand and crying. I remember one friend's suicide included a hose taped to the exhaust and then fed into the window of his car and slashing his wrists open to make sure. I remember having toast for dinner with canned gravy. I remember having pancakes for dinner. I remember Christy throwing another girl through a window. I remember the cops coming. I remember how hot the night was and what the clouds looked like, electric and dark and blue, when a friend's older brother walked through the neighborhood shooting a gun in the air until the police came and shot him with all the guns they had brought. I remember our house was robbed. I remember our house was robbed four times. But what in all this makes me a hero? That these things had happened that I had witnessed them and yet kept enough distance as to not fall into the pit of the great nothing and the great everything they made, not risk my life, risk shaving my own head and marching through the neighborhood, risk carrying a gun into the park, risk a needle, a broken jaw, a blade. Should I be celebrated even by my own hand for the life I was born into? No. The illumination the ecstatic creation is not the life. It really, really isn't. It is not the living. The living is, in the end, corporeal, always. The illumination, the light, is the poem. And no matter the subject, the poem can fail. That is, it can come up short of the subject. Or as I tend to do, it can make a hero of the narrator. The poem, at worst, can be a place where everything is questioned but the self, the soul. It can be a room built for the self to walk around feeling pretty good, feeling pretty proud about, well, itself. And so distancing itself from both the writer and the reader, from the subject matter, and not including the self, the soul, and the blood and shit, but saying, look, look, I walk on water and bring you this news, this good news of me, which is always this. I'm a good person. I am different from everyone else, but I'm not, not exactly. I am linked not only by my presence and all those remembrances, but also by my disposition, by my gender and height and race, and by my romanticizing of those moments. I am not special, not a separate entity looking down at the world and then telling the world who and what it is. It's true. I want to be special. I want to be both the life I've lived and transcend above it. But as an artist, as a poet, I want to do more. I want to be something greater than a hero. I want to be human. 
I want to be the flaw that I really am. And I want to, as our friend Seshwa Miwosh suggests, engage in my own shadow, to walk into that shadow and see how connected I am, how I am not special, but made up of molecules that are constantly making mistakes, that I am a bigot, small-minded, jealous, afraid, as much as I am empathetic, understanding, or benevolent. For me, the craft of poetry is not a tool of heroism, not a mountain from which to lecture. Instead, it's a tool of inquiry, and in particular, of failure and redemption. <laughs>